What is the first thing you're going to do? What are you going to tackle when you're sworn in? First thing I think is making sure that we have a team around us that reflects the, the ambition and the vision that I have for the state. I think one of the, the mistakes I made when I became treasurer was not asking for the resignation of directors. Um, not because there's anything wrong with any of them, but as a way of demonstrating here's, here's where I want to go. And if that's not uh, where someone else wants to go, no hard feelings, that's fine. I want to be surrounded by people who will point out when I'm missing something, but I think having a basic um, you know, agreement on the direction that we're headed is going to be really important. How about uh, statewide problems or issues? Any of, which of those would you tackle first? Well, I think we're on a good trajectory, but continuing to make sure that everyone is vaccinated and that we're getting control of the, the virus is going to allow us to take on all the other things. Hopefully that'll be over by November, won't it? I sure hope so, but yeah, absolutely. But not losing track of that in the, in the meantime uh, really matters and, and staying, uh, you know, staying proactive with respect to, to public health that makes those things uh, harder otherwise. Uh, beyond that, I think uh, we're looking very closely at what's happening with, with homelessness and, and violence right now. Um, that's such an important element of how people feel confident and safe and willing to take on other things. Um, education, making sure that there is a, a clear and consistent plan for keeping schools open, keeping uh, kids and educators safe. Um, that's what, another thing that is so central to our economy and our, and our future success. All of those are, are big priorities. How would you address the homeless crisis? Well, what frustrates me about what we're seeing right now, apart from the fact that it's not working, um, just look around, walk around, um, is, is our seeming tendency to think of this in a, um, in a binary sort of choice. Um, I think we have to have an all of the above strategy. So it is not compassionate, I don't think, uh, to allow our, our neighbors to continue living on the street in unsafe conditions. We need to acknowledge the humanity of people who are in that situation, but it's not okay to leave them uh, in that place. Similarly, it's not fair to folks who feel unsafe, who are trying to, to get to work, to, to go on with, uh, with life. So we can't put everything on the notion of waiting for the construction of, of permanent housing. We need to take immediate action and, uh, and deal with, with emergency transitional housing. I'm a strong supporter of the, the call that mayors across the state have made on the legislature uh, and the governor to prioritize funding for those kinds of emergency uh, supports and emergency shelters in, this, in the short term. In the long run, we can do a lot more to, to build those um, affordable housing units faster, cutting through bureaucracy, making uh, more rapid progress on that. But in the short term, we can't let our parks and public spaces be taken over by unsafe uh, encampments. Do you support the large tent camping ideas or the large warehouse ideas? I think we've got more details to understand about how those would work, but developing ideas that would support immediate action to get people off the street out of unsafe conditions uh, are definitely good things. And at the end of the day, if people will not move, would you force them to? I think we have to look at ways to get people those, um, those opportunities to get the, the mental health services, the addiction services that they need, and say, yes, this is not the safe place for you to camp. You can't camp here. So that's a yes? It's a yes. At the end of the day, they would be arrested or somehow forcibly I think there's, there's going to be a really small number of people who are in that situation if we are doing an adequate job of giving people those opportunities of saying, here is a safe place for you to be. Here is where you can get access to the services that you need and get on the trajectory towards, um, towards permanent housing. So I think the number of people that really are going to actively oppose that is, is quite small. And ultimately, uh, you know, I, I don't like the idea of arrest, but I think compelling people to, to move um, off of the street when they have alternative places to camp is something we'd have to consider. Okay. I thought you were saying yes till you said have to consider. Well, yes. I, I do think they're way, making sure that we're ultimately going to say, no, you can't camp here. I'm not saying arrest necessarily, but, but compelling people to say, you can't camp here. You yes. are moving on whether you want to or not. Yes. yes. Um, okay, what about Portland's gun violence epidemic? This is a huge problem. I mean, look at the numbers. I was, um, even before the headlines of this last several days, I was looking at the numbers from, from 2021, and if I'm remembering them correctly, Seattle in 2021 had 31 shooting deaths, and Portland had over 70. Um, and that's in a smaller city, a lot more violence. So this is a huge problem. And I'm going to be rolling out some specific uh, proposals and plans later this week for this. I think we have to be 
on offense in this respect. We have to ban ghost guns, the, the untraceable firearms that, that uh, are an increasing problem. I think we have to hold uh, parents accountable if their weapons are used by their, their children to commit a crime. I think we need more uh, officers on the street who are trained um, to go after gun violence and people who are, are dealing illegally uh, in firearms. We can, we can do this we can, if we are willing to, to fund those violence, uh, you know, anti-violence programs that have not been funded adequately in, in recent years. And um, it's not okay to, to get acclimated to this increasing level of violence. The numbers are, are striking and, and alarming. Yeah, we hear that from our viewers every day. Yeah. Would you use state money then to bolster and refund instead of defund Portland police? I'd absolutely look at that. I think about this as a, as a parent, as I'm sure lots of others do. Um, we can't, what are we doing if we're not um, promoting a, a safe uh, environment for people to grow up and, and live up to their full potential? So yeah, absolutely. I think that's, uh, that's amongst government's first and, and primary responsibilities to, to create a safe state. If Portland descends back into the nightly riots, would you be willing to send in state police? I think it would depend a lot on the circumstances and the specifics, and I think the, the relationship between state government and local government is something you have to take really careful consideration of. Um, overstepping that would, would potentially be dangerous, but I'd absolutely consider that, especially if, uh, if city government needed that help. And just to circle back on the state funding to help refund police, I think you said I would definitely consider that, which is not exactly a yes or no. Well, it's hard, it's hard to know because of the circumstances. I mean, it, it's a question of for what specific purpose. You know, I, I'm not, I think there is room to, uh, to invest in specific skills and specific tools uh, for law enforcement. So I'm careful in that way because it would depend on the, on the specifics. But if we're talking particularly about um, violence interruption programs, um, making sure that there are, are, um, there's capacity for people who have that specific skill, then yes, absolutely. What about climate change? Do you believe climate change is happening and that it's a problem? Yes. Well, with some people, it's not obvious, so we gotta ask that question. No problem, that's a, that's a one word answer for me. What would you do to help battle climate change as Oregon's governor? Well, I, I'm pleased that we have made some really specific goals uh, and articulated our goals as a state, but this is another example, I think, of where uh, we can be long on good intention in Oregon and not necessarily as, as long as we should be on execution and follow through. So we've articulated our goal to be 100% uh, clean energy by 2040, but I think to make that a reality, we've got to be really aggressive in, in building out uh, offshore wind, for example, in building out additional uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, making sure that people have access to, to electric vehicles, um, motivating additional efficiencies in um, homes and, and businesses. All of those things um, take programmatic support, take investment, uh, but I think there's real uh, opportunity there because we'll be able to create jobs too. Um, the opportunity to, you know, it's, it's hard to outsource uh, replacement of windows and adding of insulation. Um, those kinds of things can, can be a huge um, uh, plus to our, to our economy as well. Would you continue the governor's program on, that is lowering, lowering the carbon, I guess the cap and trade that was not able to get through the legislature but is being done by executive order? I think there, uh, is, continuing that, that trajectory is absolutely something we'd be committed to. I, I would be, you know, I'm open to, to alternative ways of getting there, um, but I think having started on that trajectory, we're going to find ourselves uh, accelerating in that direction as, as the reality of, of the world physically and politically continues to accelerate. We have to do that in the interest of, of our, our kids and grandkids. And what do you mean by open to others, other ways to get there? Well, the goal for me is, is decarbonizing our economy. And if there are, you know, what, what frustrated me about government generally is we sometimes get stuck on one way of doing things, even when there are alternatives um, that can be more effective and more efficient. So I don't ever want to be the person that says, that's the way we've done it, that's the way we'll always do it. So I'm committed to that trajectory and that direction, but I'm open always to discussions about whether there are ways to do things better. Do you have specific things that you're thinking of or you're just saying, 
I'm saying in general, industry, bring, bring something that'll get us there better and won't hurt you as much. We're still okay with that. We'll, we'll talk about that, yes. Uh, education. Graduation rates are relatively low compared to the rest of the country. Students have lost a lot of instruction time during the pandemic. Probably you know that from your own kids. Do. Um, do you think the public education system needs to be improved? And if so, how would you do that? Yes, I absolutely think it has to be improved. Um, the first is making sure that we are investing early on. Um, one thing that bothers me a lot is the, the numbers associated with um, third grade reading. That's an enormously predictive indicator of, of future success. If a, if a kid is reading on par at third grade, they're likely to be uh, on a good path for graduation and the future they want. If they're not, all kinds of other challenges may be in front of them. So let's look at those numbers with, with really specific focus. We can look at what uh, geographic factors, what demographic factors are in play, and make sure that, um, that teachers have the, the skills and experience with, with proven methods uh, of instruction on, on reading. That's a, a first step. Um, let's look at, at how, um, how we can extend the school year to help people catch up um, to, to do something they were struggling with perhaps, to add enrichment opportunities. That might look different in one school district versus another. We have 197 of them across the state. Um, but we shouldn't be limited by just trying to uh, restore what was, what was pre-pandemic. Um, that wasn't working in the way that we want. Um, so let's make sure that we have that, um, that freedom, that flexibility, those resources in place, uh, and make sure that we're acknowledging the tremendous work that educators are doing right now. They're not just being asked to be teachers, they're asked to do all kinds of unprecedented things right now, and we have to do the, the things that remove barriers um, that are preventing them from doing their work right now. Um, why is it that, that bureaucratic hurdles are keeping um, substitutes who want to be in the classroom helping out uh, from being there and, and giving teachers the, the capacity to, to respond to individual needs right now? They're overwhelmed um, and, and we can do a lot more to help. What are the bureaucratic hurdles you're talking about? Well, two anecdotes that I've heard recently uh, are, the, are how far back um, the um, process is in reviewing applications for, for being a substitute. Um, there are um, fees that are being charged uh, for people who want to be substitutes. And in this environment where there are, there's plenty of money around, that seems to me that should not be a barrier. We should, we should remove that fee and say, if you, if you want to be a substitute, we'll review your application and they won't charge you to do it. That would be too common sense. I don't know how you expect to get that through. Uh, let's see. Do you, we're asking everybody this, do you believe the 2020 presidential election was illegally stolen from President Trump? I do not. All right then. Uh, are you concerned about election integrity in Oregon? I think we should always be concerned about that, but I don't, I don't see any reason to think that we are, we are at any risk. I think our, our structure and our system is, is secure and we have a lot to be proud of in the way that we make it easy for people to vote. The legislature has become a bit more divisive in recent years. Will you be able to form productive relationships with the leaders of the opposite party? I sure think so. Um, I served in the legislature for 10 years and I had great relationships with people that I, I didn't agree with. Um, I think of a couple in particular when I was uh, the, uh, the whip for the Democratic caucus. My um, counterpart on the Republican side was Tim Freeman, who's now a Douglas County Commissioner. And we used to joke that we agreed on just about zero, um, but we worked really well together because we were honest with each other. He would tell me what his caucus was gonna do. I would tell him what, what our caucus was gonna do and we worked really well together. Um, same is true uh, when in the, uh, the 2011 um, session when it was 30-30, every um, committee had co-chairs. I was co-chair of the Transportation and Economic Development Committee with uh, now Congressman Cliff Bentz. Um, and we did something great. We had, uh, you know, in the normal, this is a little bit, little bit of a story, but I, uh, I think it's emblematic. Um, in a normal session, the chair of the committee decides whether a bill gets a hearing or not. Um, in that session, both co-chairs had to agree. So someone would, would come to, to me and say, can I have a hearing on this bill? And I'd say, well, what did, what did Representative Bentz say? They'd say yes or no, or I haven't talked to him yet. And so there's three conversations that have to happen. So eventually I went to, um, to Representative Bentz and said, this is silly, let's have office hours where they'll come to us, they'll make their pitch, and we'll decide on the spot. I don't think they liked it because they, didn't, they couldn't tailor their argument to the two of us, but I thought it was great. So I learned things from what Representative Bentz asked. Hopefully I contributed something It was much more efficient. So then we fast forward to 2013, we're back to the normal um, setup where it was a majority and a minority. Um, I was now chair and Cliff Bentz was the vice chair. I said, we're still doing the office hours and we still did it and it was much more efficient, much more effective. He's a guy I could go to and say, 
I know you're going to vote against this bill, but can you tell me how to make it stronger? Can you help me on this thing? And, and he would. So I think those are, those are examples of the kind of approach that, that I would bring. Um, I enjoy being in, in other parts of the state. Being a statewide elected official um, you know, forces me to listen to people that I don't agree with um, and to try to uh, assemble coalitions. I think those are, um, those are important uh, qualities as well as uh, trustworthiness in, in a governor. And with the office hours, would you guys be sitting next to each other? Yes. Okay, Oregon's a blue state with a lot of deep red areas. Can you represent all Oregonians? You bet. I was raised in Idaho. I spent time traveling across the state even before I was uh, an elected official it was, as a college student, uh, all of those sorts of things. Um, ultimately, I think Oregonians are, are connected with each other and all of us want our, our families to be happy and safe and healthy and nearby and, and to have a, a brighter future. And that's a, a great place to start. Um, you know, being treasurer has, has given me the chance to connect with people and understand the, the varied circumstances that, that people confront across Oregon. And I think that's the, the place to start. Uh, we don't need to ask you about Nicholas Kristof again. <laughs> um, how about, uh, I forget if we asked this. Well, there is one thing about okay. him, though. I think because, I mean, it's clear that there is a, there is a, a two-person race now. And um, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of commonality between, uh, between me and Mr. Kristoff. I went to see him before he got in the race, and um, I'd read his book and, and emailed him and said, hey, can I come ask you about your book? That was really interesting. He said yes, and we spent some time walking around the farm and talking about things. And you know, I really appreciate the way that he um, essentially has been holding up a mirror to, to the, the shortcomings that, um, that we're experiencing in Oregon, the way we're not uh, serving people in, in rural communities, um, people who are struggling with, uh, with drug addiction, um, all those kinds of things, and, and lots of other ones I'm, um, I'm sure I'm not thinking of at the moment. Um, so I think we have a lot of things in common, and I'm looking forward to continuing to engage those kinds of conversations with him. I did notice that you were quick to email his <laughs> and invite all of his supporters to come into your camp. Yeah, I mean, he. I think what a lot of people... Um, liked about his campaign was his willingness to challenge the status quo and say these are some of our shortcomings and that's certainly something that's motivating to me as a candidate as well to say what we're doing right now is not working and you know I feel a lot of frustration on the part of, of Oregonians and I, I understand it I agree with it so I think that's a place where, where he and I are, are well aligned. And if I could take you back to cap and trade for just a second I was remembering our earlier conversation and when I asked you about the Republicans walking out, you seemed to feel that it was because maybe um, it was too ham-handed, which is not a great term, but it was shoved down their throats and that's why they walked out. Is that? Well, I think that's a reasonably fair description. What I, was, what I recall saying was that anytime uh, someone is walking out, the other side ought to look in the mirror and say, what, what is it about this process that has caused people to think that their best option is to withdraw? Um, I don't think, you know, a lot of things that we do that are challenging and worthwhile are not going to be unanimously supported, and that's okay. But what I hope we can construct is a process where people who, who aren't successful with their arguments will at least be able to say, you know, I'm frustrated by the outcome, but I did get this. I did get to say my piece, and it's still better for me and for the people I represent to stay engaged in that process. Um, what worries me is, is people saying, I don't want any part of it. That's not good for, for our state or for our, our process in the long run. It's, but it's about um, the governor uh, considering commuting the sentences of juvenile killers that have been in the system for a while. You support that idea or not? I need to learn more about the specifics. I don't generally like the idea of making blanket statements on a, on a large range of, of different cases. Um, what I've learned uh, is that details matter there, and I'd need to know more about the specifics. I think it's, it's often good to, to take a second look when circumstances change, but I wouldn't be comfortable saying yes or no to, the, to that whole range. Okay, that's fair. Anything else you wanted to get in? Uh, I think just the, the notion that it's a, it's a two-person race now, and, and there's a clear contrast um, between the, the major candidates here. Um, I, my frustration, I think, parallels uh, Oregonians that, that what we're doing right now is, is not working, that we need a change, that we need um, to, to follow up our good intentions with real execution. Um, that's the difference um, for me. Um, I know that just passing the bill, um, that just dedicating money to a certain cause is not enough. That you have to actually execute. 
we see examples of, of falling short on that, whether it's the uh, you know, breakdown of our unemployment benefit system or our inability to get rental assistance to people who are facing eviction. Uh, in this race, it really matters to have someone who has been in the role of executing and following through. Well, and some of what we hear from the voters is they don't like any of you guys. Democrats have been in control for 20 or 30 years. They want to throw all of you out. Fair enough. Yeah, I understand that frustration. And I think the, uh, the case I'm making is that I've had the experience to be effective and the, uh, the results um, that, that speak for themselves. And I share the frustration. I want to see execution and results, not just talk. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.